Yeah, so today, well, it's the start of another year. Hopefully 2016 is going to be better for all of us. Okay, it might be a good time to start. But before we start um, tonight's tutorial, would there be any questions or comments that any one of you may wish to make? So let me begin, though, by saying, by greeting you a Happy New Year. I hope everyone had a good time during the Christmas break and that you're looking forward to a better year in 2016. So I, would, I wish everyone uh, more blessings, more good fortune, more success, more good health, and uh, improvements in your love life for 2016. I think it's going to be a I think it's going to be a great year, man, Jay. I think uh, we're all going to get high distinctions in administrative <laughs> law, and it's going to be wonderful. Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. But I'm going to claim the promise of a better uh, love life for myself in 2016 because 2015 was a horrendous year for me. So I'm going to claim that for myself in 2016. Okay. And I, I wish that the same for most of you. For most of you who might be looking for the... Uh, you know, the, the, the other partner there. Okay, so it's a, it's a good year to begin. Okay, um, yeah, but I do hope that many of you will do well in administrative law. So I'm hoping that, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that will happen. Anything else? Yeah, I feel a lot better. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, I feel a lot better this time. <laughs> yeah, I love life. Okay, so we could probably begin. So tonight's topic. Uh, Sorry. Yes. Andre, can I just butt in quickly? Sure. Um, I apologise if this has already been made obvious, but when do you suspect our memo results will be back? I think that uh, based on the course profile, it shouldn't come out until the 20th of um, January. I think um, based on the course profile, I promise that the results, no. Actually, the results will come out on the 22nd of January, which is a Friday. So that's going to be January 22 of Friday. That's when I will release the results of the uh, legal memorandum assessment. Okay, so we could probably, so thanks for that question. Let's proceed. So. Today's topic is going to be on unauthorized decision making. And so after studying this topic, you should then be able to discuss and explain whether legal authority is required for every executive decision or action to be made, uh, as well as uh, being able to discuss and explain and authorize decision making and the types of executive decisions and actions that do not require specific legal authority. So let's begin by uh, discussing the first, talking about the first discussion question. Can I get a volunteer to read the discussion question for us? And this, kind, this is kind of a review question because we kind of covered this in the previous, uh, in the previous week. I'll do it. Yes, thank you. Um, judicial review is said to be of limited scope that focuses on the process of decision making observance of fairness, procedural fairness, and natural justice, etc., and not on the decision itself. In what circumstances is judicial review said to involve a review of the decision itself? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Can I get some answers to that question there? So in what circumstances, and you could just... Type your answers in the chat box or pick up the mic and um, answer the question. So in what circumstances is judicial review said to involve a review of the decision itself? Um, if Maggie here, Mandy. Maggie, yes. Um, in one of the circumstances, I wrote that it was the when necessary test of abuse of power, yes. um, which permits the court to write down a decision which is so unreasonable that no reasonable decision could have reached it. Mm. Yes. So, uh, Mag Maggie, if you, could just, if you could just amplify that a bit, why, why would you say that um, the, the test of witness very unreasonableness actually touches, touches upon the decision itself? Um, well, I guess because if it's so blatantly obvious, that the decision 
couldn't have been made in any reasonable circumstance whatsoever, mm. then I guess, and it would apply? Yes. So again, so that's correct. Thank you, Maggie. So in general, if you speak of a judicial review, the judicial review focuses not on the decision itself, but actually on the process of decision making. So in that case, when you speak of whether or not um, the decision is contrary to law or whether or not the decision is lawful, we're not actually determining whether or not the decision itself, the substantive aspect of the decision, is contrary to law. Judicial review is limited more to the process of decision making. So in that case, we're looking at observance of fairness, procedural fairness, and natural justice, and so on. But the time, the, the only one of the instances when we might say that judicial review actually looks at the decision itself is the notion of when this may be unreasonableness. Because what the court then does is to determine if the decision is, you know, meets uh, the tests of uh, when this very unreasonableness. Because if it does, meaning if the decision is such that no reasonable authority could actually arrive at that decision, then in that case. Uh, the decision would be considered to be uh, unlawful or contrary to law. So in doing so, therefore, uh, the court in a sense touches upon or kind of looks upon the decision itself. But not so much the substantive aspect, although it does appear like the, the court looks at the sub substantive aspect, but what the court really does is to determine whether or not looking at the decision, whether no reasonable authority could actually arrive at that decision. Because if no reasonable authority could arrive at that decision, what it actually means, one, will be is as if there is actually no, there is no evidence. There is nothing to base the decision on. And the requirement is that every decision must actually have a lawful basis. There must be a basis, there must be a lawful basis for a decision. So if there is no basis for the decision at all, because, you know, no reasonable authority could actually arrive at that decision, then that decision has got to be unlawful and contrary to law. So let me repeat, as far as judicial review is concerned, judicial review does not touch upon the merits or the substantive aspect of a decision. Judicial review is limited in that sense that it focuses more on the decision-making process. And not only does it talk about observance of fairness, but you know, uh, looking at whether or not considerations that were meant to be considered were considered, uh, irrelevant considerations that should not have been considered, should not be considered at all, so these are just, again, so when we, when we look at these things, we're actually focusing on the decision-making process itself. So the only instance you might say that the substantive aspect of a decision seems to be reviewed in a judicial review is when uh, the, the, the court arrives at a determination that a decision meets the test of readiness, very unreasonableness, because no reasonable authority could have arrived at a decision. So when we speak of a reasonable authority, we're not even relying on the subjective judgment or appraisal of a court, but um, a reasonable authority in the sense that the original decision maker or somebody who is, who is meant to arrive at that decision in the first place uh, we should, should not be in a position to um, arrive at that decision in the first place. So in other words, Looking at all the, uh, the, the, the circumstances of the case, looking at the context of the case, there would have been a general agreement that only one uh, kind of decision could be arrived at. So if, um, if notwithstanding the fact that there, there is a general agreement that any reasonable authority could only arrive at a decision, and yet notwithstanding that, there seems to be a decision that seems to, be just, so, to just be so alien uh, in the sense that no reasonable authority could arrive at that, then that touches upon uh, the notion of witness very unreasonableness. Okay, um, so we will proceed. Hey, man, could yes. I ask a question, Manjo? Yes, go ahead, Jacob. With, with, with like um, local authorities like the council and stuff, yes. is, it, is it unreasonable to ask a, a, a property owner to um, cut their grass if it's too long because um, it, it may or may not um, be a nesting place for, for snakes and stuff like that that could, um, you know, come out and bite someone or something, you know? Yes. It, can that be challenged? Like uh, if, they, if they send you something saying, you've been ordered to cut your grass, you haven't complied, we're going to fine you, 
Um, is that open to administrative action in any way, a review of that decision or? Yes. So that's a very good uh, question, Jacob. And it, it does in fact touch upon uh, our topic tonight on uh, an authorized decision making. So in that scenario, what we see here is a local council uh, ordering um, you know, a private individual to act in a certain way. And in that sense, therefore, there seems to be an interference with the rights of the property owner because a property owner in general should be permitted to do what he wants with his property. Now, because of the council's decision, uh, the council's decision seems to interfere with the right of a property owner. So there's obviously an interference with the property owner's rights. The question is, would it be legal uh, and permissible for the local council to do so? We then have to ask uh, whether or not the local council has the authority, the legal authority, to compel a property owner to act in a certain way. And that, that uh, brings us to two possible sources of uh, legal authority. One of, obviously would be uh, prob probably a law that is passed by, a, uh, by the state itself, giving a local council the authority to, to, to make such an order. It could also be a federal legislation that recognizes uh, that um, local councils can act in a certain way. But in both instances, what it means is that because the local council is interfering with a property right of a property owner, then it is crucial for the, for the local council to be able to identify a positive law. So in other words, a, an enactment on which then it can base its decision to order the, uh, the property owner to act in a certain way. Brad, did you raise your hand? Brad, did you want to say something? Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Uh, um, yes. To, to give an example of that, which is quite irrelevant in, a, in where I live, <clears throat> um, we have like dog beaches. So there's areas where dogs can be. Yes. Um, but the council has no authority below the high water mark. Hmm. So if someone got a fine and they were below the high water mark at the time, they could actually only find them for actually if they saw them crossing the council area, yes. which is not permitted. Mm. So, which often they'll issue fines at the end of the street where my beach is. Yes, they'll try and issue a, issue a fine, but the people if they're below the high water mark, the council officer actually has no authority to actually issue that fine. Mm. Okay. So, in it, so you know, it's an unauthorized yeah. use of their power, which they actually aren't, because below the high water mark um, is um, is it the um, 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 natural resources. Okay. Um, so it's a state authority. It's a state authority below that mark. Thank you. Yes. Now, I, I don't want to pursue that topic too much because we might be digressing because we're kind of looking into who actually has the power in the first place to set uh, the rules in relation to beaches. So whether or not, uh, you know, it could be, the, is it the Commonwealth or is the power to legislate in relation to beaches or is it the no, state, state, or state government? Council. Now, yeah, yeah. So, um, I don't want to go into that because I'm not sure if that's really an administrative law question. Possibly that's constitutional law because it involves the question of what's the legal authority to actually pass legislation in that regard. So that might be well, a if they, question. Well, the, 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 point would, the main point would be that if that fine was issued, yes. you could actually appeal that decision uh, yes. at the administrative appeals to say that the, yeah. the council had no authority in that area where they issued the, that's right. um, the fine. That's so that's right. what I'm saying, being yes. an administrative administrative issue where it's unauthorized conduct yes. by a um, government agency. I get it. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. The, the other question that I, I would have raised would be that what if, what if um, both the local council and the state parliament actually pass legislation um, saying that 
um, you know, control, regulating the, the access of dogs to beaches that belong to the public. Uh, in that case, the, the question becomes, would, so let's say, let's, let's speak of a local council in that sense, okay? Assuming that there is no, there is no legislation coming either from the state parliament or coming even from the Commonwealth parliament, so now there is no law in that, in that regard, but the local council on its own passes a resolution uh, controlling or regulating the access uh, uh, by the public, especially in relation to dogs, um, of certain public beaches. So the question is, in that case, would it be, would that kind of resolution constitute an example of an authorized decision making? In other words, would there have been a need for a positive law that would have granted specific legislative authority to the council to, to pass a regulation limiting access to public beaches by dogs. Um, I believe it would be in the powers passed down by the state government for the council to create its bylaws mm. for the administration of its, of its council authority area. Now, what if there is no state legislation that empowers the local council to regulate uh, certain public beaches that belong to the council? So what if there well, is... The, be the beaches, it's actually not the beaches aren't owned by the council, mm -hmm. it's the access points okay. from the, onto the beach and they only have authority to the high water mark. Okay. Um, yes, uh, that's right. So I'm looking at the statement of uh, rice here. There is no decision there, though. Okay. But there is an action. So what, what if there is that resolution which controls the access to beaches? By the, so there is, a, there is a, um, a local council resolution that controls access to, to beaches. And we're assuming that there is no... Uh, empowering law coming from either the state parliament or the federal government that empowers the local council to, uh, to you know, regulate access by, by dogs to beaches. The question I have is, would that be an example of an, an authorized decision making because the local council cannot cite a specific positive law that empowers it to control access to be just by dogs. Was that question clear? Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, I would, I would agree with you because they can't find the dog, but they can find the dog owner. Uh, okay, so the, the point I was making, and we're going to proceed with this, is that the question is, was there an interference of a right so if you go back to Entick versus Carrington and the, the Somerset City Council or Somerset County Council, the rule is that there is a need only for a positive law when there is an interference of a right. So in this case, you would have to go back to the question of, is there actually a right on the part of dogs to be in beaches? So if there is no right, then in that case, you cannot claim an interference of a, of, of a right which would then require or necessitate a reference to a positive law. Hey, Manjo. Yes. Could you say it's um, maybe if we put the dogs in with the people because they've got a bit of a symbiotic relationship there, could you say it's restricting people's freedom of movement in a public place? Is that a right that someone has to move about? You know, if they're not and trespassing on private property and stuff would that be beyond would that be beyond their power to make such a decision a local council yeah that, well we could probably have an agreement we could probably agree that people have, have a, a, a right to beaches but the question is do people actually have a right to bring their dogs to beaches is there a right probably not no probably not no okay so in that case therefore so if you cannot identify a right uh, on the part of um, you know individuals to bring their dogs to beaches, then it is within the power of a local council to regulate that activity even in the absence 
of a positive law that empowers the, the, the local council to act in a certain way. So going back to the case of Entake versus Carrington and Somerset uh, County Council, the only instance when you, you need a reference or an identification of a positive law, the only time when that is necessary is when there is an interference with the right of a person or of people. So when it does not involve an interference of a right because there is no right involved, then you don't need uh, a recourse to positive law. Now, I don't want to go to the nature of discrimination to dog owners who are moving too far away. So let's move on. We're going to go to discussion question two this time. Uh, okay, where are we now? Okay. So, can I get a volunteer, somebody to read discussion two for us, please? I'll read it, and, uh, Thank you, Maggie. The Minister of Health created a health awareness program that provided a budget of $20 million for a program to promote awareness of men's depression as a health issue. Red Manson asserts that the program is rubbish and has called on the Minister to withdraw the funding claiming that the money is better spent on the other programs in the current economic environment. <clears throat> he also asserts that the minister has no legal authority to make the budgetary decision. When the minister refused to revoke his decision, Manson considered filing an application for judicial review on the ground that the decision is unauthorised. He has come to you as solicitor. <clears throat> what would you advise him? Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Um, can I get your answers? Uh, can you put your answers in the chat box? To get an answer from Libby here. I hope that's still readable. So this is an answer from Libby. I would advise Manson not to file for judicial review because there is no requirement for there to be statutory authority to empower this type of decision. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I get the answers from the others? Mm, very good. So, uh, so um, from from Libya as well. This decision does not interfere with or impair the rights of or interests of citizens, and the minister may exercise the executive power under Section sixty one of the Australian Constitution. Okay. Now, how about the others here? From Michael, the facts of this matter are that the Minister of Health has created a health awareness program. Uh, this is not the result of an enactment, however, it would fall within the auspices of Section 81 of the Constitution. The executive decision in this case does not interfere with the rights and does not require statutory authority. Such a program uh, can be supported by Section 81 of the Constitution. Okay. Now, on what grounds... Um, can you say that an application for judicial review will actually fail? So looking at possible ways by which you can, you can question an application for judicial review, what are those grounds on which you can question an application for judicial review? So if you can look at them. So you can obviously, um, question whether or not uh, judicial review is actually possible because you can argue that uh, this is not, uh, that this is in fact an authorized decision. So you can make that argument. So the decision is authorized because even in the absence of a specific statutory enactment, there is actually no requirement for there to be a statute that authorizes the minister to uh, create this program. Okay, that's one. Would there be any other way by which a, you could question uh, an application for judicial review? So we've got it here from Vanessa, jurisdiction, standing, and remedies. Okay, very good. 
relating first to standing, why, why is uh, standing um, relevant here? From Biang as well, no standing. Why? From Libya, no standing. Because? Because red is not affected directly by the decision. That's right. Very good. So red is not directly affected by the decision. So he lacks standing. What else? Okay, from rice, non-justiciable. Uh, then he says prerogative power. So what does it mean, non-justiciable? Why isn't this a why, why do we say non-justiciable here? What do we mean? What do we mean by that? Not an adversive decision. This seems to be an adversive decision. The question, though, is, is it justiciable. Sorry. Yeah. Um, because it doesn't exceed constitutional powers. It's not unreasonable. Um. If, Stabbing in the if, if, if you speak of it's not unreasonable, you're actually saying that it's a justiciable question. So you're saying... Yeah, actually, that, oh, can I remove that comment because we had that discussion last time? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the assumption, when, when you say that the, the question is not justiciable, you're actually saying that the courts will refrain from reviewing the decision in the first place. So because the courts will refrain from reviewing the decision in the first place, it will not happen that the courts will say that the decision is unreasonable. So what it essentially means when you're saying that it's not justiciable is that the courts will back off from even dealing or handling that case in the first place. So what does it mean? So from, from Brad, court does not have the power to make a judicial decision as not based on law. Is that what we mean by non-justiciable? Is that what we mean by non-justiciable? No, it means that the executive, that they shouldn't be interfering with decisions that the executive are entitled to or should be making. Mm. So, what it essentially means, and because we touched upon jurisdiction, when you speak of an issue that is non-justiciable, the court actually has the jurisdiction to decide uh, that issue. So the court has the jurisdiction to make a final and de a, a, a de determinative decision on the, the question, on the case that is before the court. So there is no question that the court has jurisdiction. But when we say that it is non-justiciable, what we're essentially saying is that notwithstanding the fact that the court does have jurisdiction to make a valid and binding decision on the case before it, the court will refrain from exercising its jurisdiction out of respect for the executive department. So what it essentially means is that the court is saying that although we have jurisdiction, to entertain this case, we will refrain from uh, making a decision on this case because that decision is best left to the elected uh, representatives or officials of, of Australia. So this is left, best left to um, the executives or best left to, to the legislature. So it's a political question involving national policy and it is not for the courts um, to second guess uh, you know, what the national policy should be. It is something that uh, is, is left to the, uh, to the elected officials of, of the nation. So it becomes a political question in that sense. So there are three ways by which, therefore, um, you can question um, the success, uh, whether or not an application for judicial review will, will prosper. You can question, number one, um, an application for judicial review that it, you can actually say that it is likely to fail because one, um, Red Manson does not have uh, legal standing. He is not an aggrieved. He does not. He's not affected by um, you know the, the health awareness program. And two, uh, there's a question of non-justiciability. So that even if a court actually has jurisdiction to, um, because the courts usually have jurisdiction either on the basis of Section 75, Paragraph 5 of the Constitution, or on the basis of um, Section 90. Uh, 3B of the Judiciary Act of uh, 1903. So the courts do have jurisdiction, but notwithstanding the fact that the courts may have jurisdiction over the case, they will refrain from exercising their jurisdiction because to them it is a non-justiciable question because it involves a political question that is best uh, decided by the elected representatives of, of the nation. And the third would be uh, that you wonder whether or not there's actually a need for positive law to authorize. Uh, so you, you wonder whether or not there's actually a need for a positive law, such as an enactment passed by the parliament, 
that would then uh, empower or authorize the Minister of Health to uh, create this program. The assumption being that perhaps there is no need for a positive law in that regard. And the question is, why not? So uh, in relation to the non-justiciable question, uh, as pointed out by Rice and Grant, uh, you've got the Peko Walson case, that where uh, a political question is involved, then uh, courts will refrain from dealing with them because it's a non-justiciable question. So now going back to this issue now of um, whether or not there is a requirement for there to have been a primary legislation that would authorize the minister to create this health awareness program, the question is, do you need a positive law or an enactment coming from the Commonwealth Parliament that would authorize the Minister of Health to create a health awareness program so that if there is no such statute or positive law or enabling legislation or primary legislation coming from the Commonwealth Parliament, then the Minister of Health in acting, uh, in creating a health awareness program that sets aside a specific budget would actually be making an unauthorized action or an unauthorized executive decision. So the question is, would there have been a need for a primary legislation or enabling legislation that would have given the Minister of Health specific authority to act in the manner that he did? No. Okay. Um, so can somebody explain? Audrey, you were the first. Uh, can somebody explain or can Audrey explain why, why don't you need um, positive law in this regard? Well, but, yes. the minister, can you hear me? Yes, I could. So the minister is a member of parliament as well as a member of the executive government. Being a member of the executive government, they don't, they have powers not just from legislation, just the very being of them means that they have the inherent right to govern yes. just from existing. Mm. Very good. Um, when you say that, if you could just expound on this further, when you say that um, the minister has an inherent right to exercise uh, certain powers, what's the basis for this inherent right? Where, where is it coming from? What's the source of, of legal authority that enables the minister to act in a certain way, even in the absence of a statute? Okay, so from Peter, it's the Constitution. So you can argue, yes, that on the basis of Section 61, the executive power belongs to the executive, and the executive power under the Constitution authorizes the executive to act in ways in order to execute and maintain the laws of the Commonwealth. So there is that power coming from the Constitution. Okay, so that's a, a constitutional power. What else? What are the other sources? So, but... So as Rice Manu, what if there is no constitution? So in the absence of Section 61 of the Constitution, would, uh, would it have meant that um, the Minister of Health couldn't act in a certain way? So what if there were no constitution? Would the Minister of Health have been empowered to create this kind of program? So you need, do you need, in other words, do you need the constitution in order for the Minister of Health to have this power? And from Rice, the answer is no, because there are certain inherent powers. So th that's correct. So even in the absence of the constitution, so even if there were no constitution, of course, Australia has a constitution, but even if there were no constitution, such as you look at the UK or you look at New Zealand, where they don't have any written constitution, you will see that their you know, the cabinets and the executive ministers continue to exercise certain executive powers even in the absence of a constitutional mandate. So what's the basis for that? The basis for that is because there are certain inherent powers, or what we might say to be prerogative powers, that inhere in the executive. They're deemed to be prerogative and inherent powers because... Sorry, I just got a message and that distracted me. So they're deemed to be inherent powers because... You are assuming that under the separation of powers um, of, of, of a democratic government, the executive needs certain powers in order for it to be able to fulfill 
its functions as an executive. So even in the absence of any specific law or constitutional mandate, we would assume that in that framework of, dem of a de democratic government, the executive should be permitted to do certain things, even in the absence of a specific positive law. So such as the power to enter into contracts, the power to rearrange the ministry. Those should be inherent powers of the executive. Are we clear? So, and it's also recognized as a, uh, by, the, by the courts that the powers, for example, to enter into treaties, the power to control uh, illegal immigrants, uh, the power to, bo to, to control borders or the power to conscript um, individuals and force them to, to join um, the armed forces, for example, in the, in, the, in, the, in the case of war, the power of the, of the uh, prime minister to declare war against another nation. These are inherent powers of the executive and they actually inhere in the executive even in the absence of any constitutional provision. Okay, so we're clear on that. I'm uh, not sure about the administrative arrangements order. Okay, question so far? Now, did we answer that? So the advice would be that it would not, so the, in answer to the question, the, advice, the answer would be that if you, were, if you were to come to you as a solicitor, your advice would be that he shouldn't file an application for judicial review. One, because he doesn't have standing. Two, because the question is a political question and therefore it's non-justiciable. And three, as far as the exercise by the minister of his powers in, this, uh, in relation to the program is concerned, he does not require a, um, a, a positive law because he can either actually uh, uh, base his uh, exercise of the power of Section 61 of the Constitution or two, um, under common law principles, there are certain uh, powers of the executive that inhere in it, even in the absence of positive law. Now, from Rice, there's a comment. So there is no need for positive legislation in order to intercept refugee votes. The answer is yes. So um, the courts have recognized uh, that there is no need for positive legislation uh, on the part of the executive to intercept refugee votes. Okay, but um, when it comes, therefore, to questions of how exactly to deal with refugees uh, or to deal with immigrants on whether or not they should be granted visas, that is something else. So whether or not certain individuals may qualify uh, to be given uh, visas in Australia or, or whether or not they should be permitted to enter into Australia, um, that, that falls under the, one of the heads of power of the Commonwealth Parliament. So uh, under the Australian Constitution, the Commonwealth Parliament has uh, the power to legislate in relation to immigration. So for that reason, if it, if it becomes a question of immigration and who should be given, uh, who should be given uh, visas or granted immigrant status, then in that case, that is a power that belongs exclusively to the Commonwealth Parliament. But in relation to the question of protecting the borders of Australia, from uh, illegal immigrants that falls within uh, the power of the executive and the executive does not require any enabling legislation in that regard. So as Brad pointed out, um, so you don't require a positive law to be given to the executive as far as border protection is concerned, but when it comes to immigration, because of uh, the Australian Commonwealth Constitution, you uh, that, that is a, a, an area that belongs solely to the Commonwealth Parliament. Okay, question so far before we proceed to the next question. Okay, so none. So let's move on to question number three. No questions? Okay, question number three. Um, can, I, can I get somebody to read question three for us? Yeah, from Brad, the alien must make it to the country first. So once the alien is in the country, the, the, the executive can't just do anything that he wants. Okay? So as pointed out by Brad, if the alien was able to enter into the country, that's something else. The laws of immigration kick in, and in that case, um, it will have to be the laws passed by the Commonwealth Parliament that will have to be considered. Okay, but going back to discussion question three now, moving on to discussion question three. Can I get somebody? I'll read it for you, Minda. 
Oh, okay. Okay. Will I read it? Yes, please. Go ahead. Right. Um, Lord Chief Justice Camden's statement in Entick versus Carrington, 1765, 19 STTR 1030, is the foundational statement of the common law principle of legality. He said, by the laws of England, every invasion of private property, be it ever so minute, is a trespass. No man can set foot upon my ground without my license, but he is liable to an action. So the damage be nothing, which is proved by every declaration in trespass, where the defendant is called upon to answer for bruising the grass and even treading upon the soil. If he admits the fact, he is bound to show by way of justification that some positive law has empowered him, uh, empowered or excused him. What does the principle of legality mean? Does it mean that every executive decision in order to be lawful must be supported by a specific legal authority that authorises that decision? Thank you. Um, can I get everyone to post his or answer in the chat box? Okay, so I'm going to pick up the answer of um, Libby. She's going to have to reduce the font size, and I'm hoping that will still be readable. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay, so good. So I'm just getting some answers which I find in the chat box. Oops. From Audrey here. So, I mean, there are more there and I don't have the time to actually go through them, but let's say from Audrey here. So not every decision must be supported by a legal authority. It's only when a, an executive decision interferes with a person's rights, liberty, and property. So that's, that's the correct answer there. So the only time when you, so uh, where it was, okay. So the only time when you require a specific legal authority, in other words, you're actually looking for positive law. So when you say that you're dealing with positive law, it's an enactment coming from uh, either the Commonwealth Parliament or some other legislative body. So the only time when you require a specific legal authority or positive law is when an executive decision or action uh, interferes with the person's with a person's rights, liberty, or property. So that is the context of Entick versus Carrington, because in that case, in that case, there was an attempt on the part of uh, government officers to enter the house of uh, of Entick uh, for the purpose of them seizing certain papers that he had. And the, the Justice Lord Chief Justice Camden then said that you know a man's house is a man's castle, and you need positive law if uh, somebody is meant to interfere uh, with some of your rights. So the assumption there as well is that there is a recognized right on the part of citizens that they should have um, freedom uh, in, in their homes, that the right to the property cannot be interfered with. So there is, so we're, we're, we're also saying therefore there, in that, in that case, that there is a common law right that is recognized therefore by the courts that a man's house is his castle. That the, man, that the man's property should not be interfered with arbitrarily by uh, executive officers. So in other words, if there were no right, so in other words, let's assume that um, it, it, it's a public property or it's in a beach, the question is, um, would there be a, a, a right, for example, on the part of uh, the executive to conduct a search and seizure? So th the point there is, you will only require a positive law or a specific legal authority if certain rights, liberties, or property have been interfered with. But if it does not, if the executive action does not in involve an interference with a person's rights, liberty, or property, then you do not need um, a specific legal authority for that. Okay. So. Moving on to the final question. Is there any other questions there? Any questions so far? None? 
Um, from destiny, in the same token, individuals may lawfully do anything as long as it doesn't contravene a law. Now, that's an interesting point because um, if you will remember the case of Regina versus Somerset County Council, uh, Sir Bingham, MR, or Master of the, of the Rules, actually said that whereas uh, individuals may lawfully do anything as long as it doesn't contravene the law, um, Lord Bingham, Sir Bingham actually said that, but it doesn't apply in the case of the executive. Because in the case of the executive, you always have to ask the question, does the executive have the, the power to, to act in the way that it does? So whereas, you know, um, as far as individuals are concerned, they can do anything for as long as it, uh, their actions don't contravene the law, the point that um, Sir Bingham actually made was that in the case of executive officials, you need to ask on what base, on what legal authority they are acting. So it's different as far as the executive is concerned. And in that case, if the executive therefore acts in, uh, in a way that interferes with the rights or properties or freedoms of individuals, you always ask the question, on what basis uh, is the executive able to do that? So you need to act, look for positive law. Okay, so um, can we move on to question four? Okay, so moving on to question four, because I'm not setting, seeing any questions there. So moving on to question four. Can I get somebody to um, read question four? I think Brad earlier had volunteered to read the question. Perhaps Brad, Corby, can I ask you to read um, question four for us? Sorry, Manjo, I just had to find the mute button. Ah. <clears throat> um, Claiming broad powers under the Australian National Security Act, Commonwealth, the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, ASIO, our Director General of Security, ordered the arrest and detention for a period of 90 days of Jamison Ibrahim, an Australian citizen who was alleged to have recently committed atrocities in Syria. Ibrahim's solicitor filed an application with the Federal Court of Australia for judicial review of the legality of his continuing detention. The ASIO DG of Security asserts that the detention is legal since it is authorised by the Australian National Security Act, which provides that the ASIO Director General of Security may cause the arrest and detention for a period not exceeding 120 days of any person who he considers on the proper evaluation to be a threat to national security. Advise on the validity of the ASIO DG of Security's argument. Mm. Thank you. Okay, um, so um, can you provide your answer to the uh, to the task there? Advice on the validity of the ACO Director General of Securities argument. So he's essentially saying that uh, that their actions were legal because there is a Commonwealth legislation that authorizes the ACO Director General to act in the way that he did. Okay, I'm getting the answer here from Libby. And the answer as well <laughs> from Jacob. He can lock up anyone he wants. What do you mean by that, Jacob? Well, he, he's, he, I don't know. His argument seems to be um, in reference to this piece of legislation, he can lock up anyone that he deems to be, you know, yes. I don't know, a threat or a danger or something like that. Oh, to yes. me, it seems unreasonable, mm. um, but, you know, what do I want? <laughs> so, um, so the relevant point there is, assuming that the executive can actually cite um, specific legislation that authorizes them to act in a certain way, would it therefore mean that um, judicial review uh, is no longer available? In other words, you can no longer question the legality of the executive decision because the, uh, the executive decision is already supported by a positive law. Manjo, yes. could you say, could you say um, he's acting, what is that, ultra vias, that he's acting beyond the power of, of that piece of 
that provision? You know, he's pushing it too much or? You could make that argument, but let's make the assumption that the, um, that the, that the ACO director was acting intra -virus. Let's assume that he was actually acting within the powers that were given to him under the uh, Commonwealth legislation. So the question is, assuming that the, exec the ACO Director General was acting within the parameters of the enabling legislation, would it mean, therefore, that judicial review uh, will, will likely fail because there is an enabling law that authorizes the executive to act in a certain way? No, because he uh, also act within the rules of the Constitution. Well done. So that's the correct answer there from Maggie. So just because there is a, an enabling legislation is not an end. It does not end the question of judicial review. Part of uh, judicial review will still test um, the legality or constitutionality of the uh, enabling legislation. So if you go by the case of A versus Hayden number 2, 1984, um, the, the courts have said that it is not sufficient that the executive cites a, 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 a positive law for their actions. It is still within the power of the judiciary to determine the constitutionality or legality of the executive action, notwithstanding the existence of a positive law. Because even both the executive as well as the legislature must act within the framework of the rule of law. So in other words, we are governed by the rule of law. There are limits to executive and legislative action. So the executive or the legislature cannot act in arbitrary ways. There are limits uh, also as well imposed by the constitution. There are limits as well uh, based on common law principles, one of which is that there is a recognition that people have a right to be free. They have, they have, a, free, they, 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 they have a right to liberty. So any encroachment on the right on, on the freedoms or liberties of individuals, um, there must be a, a there must be a valid ground for such an interference. So the mere presence of a legislation will not be sufficient uh, justification for the interference of the rights and freedoms of individuals. Okay, was that clear? So, so in other words. If, for example, if there were a if there were a, a, a law that the Commonwealth Parliament passed, saying granting, for example, um, certain officers uh, of the ASIO or certain officers of the armed police to just shoot to kill anyone on the basis of a reasonable suspicion, that will not that law alone will not provide immunity to the um, to the armed police if they were in fact to obey that law and therefore just shoot to kill uh, anyone on the basis of a reasonable suspicion. So that will not immunize them from a lawsuit because in the case of uh, A versus Hayden number two, the notion of respondeat superior or the notion of following superior orders is not a, a, a justification for, um, it's not a justification for the just executive to then do what they ever, uh, you know, to do whatever they please um, simply because there is a, a law that immunizes them to act in a certain way. Because anything that the executive does or anything that the legislature does must still be done within the framework of a rule of law, it must still be done within the framework of a constitution that recognizes the existence of the rule of law and uh, recognizes constitutionalism. Okay. Question? Doesn't, doesn't this fall within Schedule 1 of the ADJR Act, making it not a you know, reviewable decision? So you could, uh, it, I, I understand what you say, is that if you can't use the ADJR Act, then you can uh, attack this problem using judicial review. Yes. Is that right? That's right. So that's a, uh, that, that's a very good point, uh, B. So um, if you follow the Schedule 1 of the ADJR Act of... Uh, 1977, then it's likely that under the Schedule 1, the decision of the ASIO, a Director General, when it comes to issues of national security, are not reviewable under that Act by the, by the courts. However, uh, if you go by um, Section 75, 
subparagraph 5 of the Australian Commonwealth Constitution, the High Court, for example, has uh, the original jurisdiction in all matters uh, involving the applications for writ of mandamus or prohibition or injunction against uh, Commonwealth officers, which is a provision as well that is uh, present in Section 39B of the Judiciary Act of 1903, which uh, grants um, the Federal Court of Australia a similar jurisdiction when it comes to uh, writs of mandamus, prohibition, or injunction against officers of the Commonwealth. And obviously, as we said, there is also a, a, a common law uh, judicial review, which does allow the courts to examine uh, executive action when such actions may uh, be considered to be excessive and contrary, for example, co contrary, for example to, to law. So assuming that you can't use the ADJ Act, you also always have to consider where, whether or not judicial review is available, is available under the Constitution or some other statutory enactment, such as the um, Judiciary Review Act of 1903, particularly Section 39B, and the common law, judicial review. Um, yes. It's Grant. So, I mean, so, basically, so basically what you're saying, why do we have an Attorney General if they're going to put out um, or make executive decisions that they know they can get through due to the ADJR, but they don't even think about that. They think, oh, we'll try our luck constitutionally anyway and just ignore the constitution. Shouldn't they be qualified enough to go, hey, it's not going to pass the constitutional test. I know the High Court can't make a decision until it's a matter, but yes. why waste government time, parliaments, the executive's time, the Senate's time, everything's time to do everything. That's a very good point. But the one thing we should remember is that judicial power is exclusive to the courts. So it is never for the executive or neither for the legislature to make a determination on what is legal or what is constitutional. So even if the Attorney General makes a, makes a statement that a law that the Commonwealth Parliament is about to pass or a regulation or a bylaw that the executive uh, has passed uh, is likely to be legal, that is not binding because it is not, and remember the, the Attorney General belongs to the executive. He's not part of the judiciary. And we have to be clear that the judicial power is exclusive to the courts. And when I say courts, they're exclusive to chapter three courts. And so therefore, if you follow the Boilermakers case, the courts will not tolerate um, the executive or the legislature making a determination as to what is legal or constitutional because uh, questions of legality or constitutionality belong exclusively to the courts or to chapter three courts. Okay. Uh, did I answer the question? Yep. Manjo. Yep, thank you. Yes. Manjo, that's um, In regards to like, this question, Yes. Um, I understand the answer that you've put forward, but do you feel that the executive are currently making decisions in the fear of acts of terrorism to sort of protect first mm. and then work out whether the person is a potential terrorist or not? Mm. And you know, saying it's 120 days, there's still um, need to provide evidence to be able to um, detain someone for that period in the absence of a charge. Yes. Um, yeah. there, uh, thank you. Um, there are several aspects to the statement that you made. Uh, number one, it is actually not for the executive alone to make a determination as to you know, when they can arrest and detain persons, mainly because, as we said, uh, if, if the executive, meaning through the police, were to arrest or detain individuals that will involve an interference of rights, which are duly recognized by the courts, so therefore, for there to be an interference of such rights through an arrest or detention, you need a positive law. So therefore, you need uh, the Commonwealth Parliament to pass a law that actually um, authorizes the police, for example, to act in a certain, certain way. Now, having said that, having recognized that you need a positive law or an enabling law coming from the Commonwealth Parliament, that then raises the next question of whether or not the Commonwealth Parliament actually has the power to legislate in relation to that. And we're, we're heading into constitutional law and I'm not prepared to get into that because that can be kind of confusing. But let it be said that, um, I hope this doesn't confuse people, but because you know it's, it's something that seems to be quite relevant. So as far as the Commonwealth Parliament is concerned, the only instance by which they can raise, um, uh, the Commonwealth Parliament can legislate, for example, in, in relation to arrests and detention 
would be by uh, using its defense powers under the Commonwealth Constitution. But if it were to do so, there is a requirement that the uh, defense power, number one, must be purposive. So in other words, um, the, the defense power, the exercise of the defense power must really be for the purpose of promoting the defense of the Commonwealth. So it can be seen that it is not for the purpose of promoting the defense because, for example, it has nothing to do with the defense, then the, the law will fail. Secondly, there's also a requirement of reasonableness and proportionality so that um, if the Commonwealth Parliament passes legislation relating to the defense of the Commonwealth, then it is necessary, it is crucial, that the law that the Commonwealth Parliament passes must be, re must be reasonable necess reasonably necessary for the purpose of, in fact, uh, promoting the defense of the Commonwealth. And that the, any mechanisms or any measures that the Commonwealth Parliament passes are proportionate to uh, its intended uh, objective of promoting the defense of the Commonwealth. And as pointed out by Maggie here, if the detention is for, for a short period of time, then the, the detention is most likely to be valid. But if it's for a longer period, then um, the courts will likely not sanction um, the legality of the legislation. Now, in addition to that, let's be clear that it is not for the executive or for the legislature to determine uh, the, the legality of an arrest or the legality of a detention. That is always a, a question that belongs solely to the courts. Okay, so it is for the courts, therefore, to determine not only the legality of a legislation, but the legality itself of an executive action or decision made in accordance with uh, a primary legislation that has been passed by the Commonwealth Parliament. Okay, so it's now 8.20. Would there be any questions before we end tonight's um, tutorial session? Can yeah, I ask a question, please, manager? Uh, was there a question? Yes. Yes. I have one. Yes, go ahead. Um, I wanted to ask um, the, there was just a letter in the mail the other day about vaccinations, family tax benefit, uh, I don't know, A or B, and yeah. vaccinations. Yes. That's coercive, isn't it? And I know it is based on legislation. Yes. However, what you've just said, it interferes with my right of property, I, I have a right to that family tax benefit. Ah, let's be clear. And I also that. have a right to liberty for my children. So how can I be coerced into giving them something or have a property right taken away? Good point. So I think a lot of us received that letter. Um, but the question, so I don't think we can deny that you do have a right to determine what you want to do with your kids. I mean, you know, there's no question about that. That's your right. But, but when we say, for example, that you have a right to government benefits, I wonder if that is the case. Because as far as government benefits are concerned, it's not a right unless the government grants it to us. So we don't have a right to certain benefits from the government. So therefore, because it is something that is given by the government, it is an entitlement, the government can determine uh, when we can have access to, to, such, to such benefits, to such entitlements. So we don't have a right to benefits. And because we don't have a right to, the, to government benefits, the government can therefore uh, really spell out the instances when we may be entitled to certain government benefits because it is not a right. Yeah, but indeed, if the government has given us certain entitlements and we meet the requirements uh, for us to be entitled to, the, to those benefits, then we do have a right. Okay, then in that case, we do have a right. So if the government, for example, passes a law saying that if you meet these certain requirements, then you are entitled to these benefits. In that case, you have a right. So therefore, if there is a, an executive action that would interfere with a right, then you, you can raise it uh, either in a judicial review or in, an, in, 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 in a merits review. But having said that, as we said, as far as the access to government benefits are concerned, it is therefore subject to, uh, to the government's determination of who might be entitled to certain rights. Now, from Libby, what about mandatory vaccination of employees? Hmm. Um, that's a, it, it will lead us to a long discussion, but that's a very interesting question, and I wonder if we have the time to discuss that tonight. But that's a very valid point. Well done. So that's a very valid point. So Libby was pointing out, uh, was raising the issue of how about mandatory vaccination of employees? 
Okay, let's leave it at that. Um, let's think about that. We don't have to answer that tonight, but that's an interesting question. So, would there be any other questions before we end tonight's session? Uh, yes, yeah, so what, what is the answer for question four? Uh, the, the, uh, this, uh, it's likely that he'll be able to detain the uh, uh, person but not exceeding 120 days. Do you so, think that's reasonable? Uh, the, the focus here is not on the legality of the law itself because that is a constitutional law question. The, the basic answer here is that the argument of the ACO Director General is actually untenable because uh, it is untenable because you, you, you recognize that there's, there is a common law right uh, of individuals to have liberty. And so, for example, in the case of our uh, Regina versus Home Secretary, Ex Party Kawaja, the court has recognized that um, individuals or citizens have a right to liberty. And because of that right to liberty, uh, the courts will not tolerate uh, an arbitrary interference with that right. And so given that there is, uh, there is that common law right that is recognized by the courts, you would then need a positive law that would authorize the ASIO Director General to interfere with uh, the right to liberty. Now, but in this case, the, the, uh, the authorization that the ASIO Director General is relying upon is the Australian National Security Act. But the mere fact alone that a, the ASIO Director General uh, is able to cite a primary legislation does not mean that uh, in that case judicial review is no longer available because um, the rule as uh, stated by the High Court in A versus Hayden number two is that it will still be up to the courts to examine the legality or constitutionality both of the primary legislation as well as the executive action that is undertaken on the basis of the primary legislation. So it, it, uh, in sum, the, uh, the argument of the ACO Director General is untenable. Okay, so I guess, I, yes? One, one more question, but not, not about tonight. You know the Zoom participation, Mark? Yes. That Zoom, what's involved in that? Um, when you start putting in your answers in the chat box or take the mic to answer the discussion question, you gain points. And um, so oh, okay. your participation engagement, your engagement in the Zoom tutorial is equivalent to answering a weekly discussion question. So how much did I get just for this now? You've got one, <laughs> it's only one, one, one percent of the final mark. All right. Yeah. Okay, yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone, and um, I'll, I'll see you again next week. Okay, good night. Bye. Can I just clarify something before okay. we go? go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. So if we've received our marks for the weekly discussion or the group discussion participation, does that include taking into consideration the weekly tutorials as well? Yes. Yes, it does. Yeah. So it's a combination of both. Um, but yeah. I'm interested in the grades because some of you might see like, you know, five out of 100. Um, yeah. so, so the maximum mark you could get for the online participation at this point is actually just five. It's five out of five. Because yeah. Yeah. Have five out of five uh, in the next set of uh, online tutorials. So yeah. if, you, if you saw a five there in your grade, that's the yeah. full mark you're getting. Okay. All right. Thank you, Amanda. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Yes. Will you be um, giving us some questions that are more similar to that of the exam before the uh, week 12? For the revision, you mean? Yeah, well, just, um, you know, I guess we don't know the style of your questions and exam uh, type situation. Will you be giving us something similar to what it's going? Obviously not the same facts because that wouldn't be yeah. fair, but uh, um, something that's similar. Yeah, in all likelihood, uh, when they come up with the final take-home exam assessment questions, they will, they will be similar to the discussion questions that I created. Okay. Kind of similar. Very good, thank you. Okay. Mento. Yes. Um, just on that take-home paper, I know that it's uh, due 11 p.m. on the 18th yes. of February. Yes. When's it released? Uh, it will be released, um, I think, 36 hours before. So it will be released on February 17th, which I think is a Thursday at 11 o'clock in the morning. So 36 hours prior to the due date. Okay, thank you.
Okay, so thank you everyone and good night and a uh, happy new year again. And I wish you the best this year. Okay, goodbye. See you next week. Bye.